to uh, open the meeting this evening, uh, Township Board meeting for Tuesday, January 24th. Uh, Mr. Huzak, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Oh, sure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, we have with us tonight for our board, Clark Kent, our trustee, Al Mansour, Ken Thomas, our treasurer, Ove Dizak, Kathy Lane, our clerk, Joe Massey, one of our trustees, Dennis Lamotta, our superintendent, and Mr. David Laddie, our attorney. With that, uh, we have a privileged presentation by our Genesee County Treasurer, Deborah Cherry, and she's going to provide a short update on her office and introduce uh, the new Genesee County Land Bank Director, Michelle Weiner. Good evening. Good evening, how are you? Very good, thank you. Can you hear me? I'm not sure if it's on, but it looks like it's on. Yes, I can. It, you can? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, well, it's a great to be here. It's been a while since I've been over here, but I um, wanted to take just a moment to do a couple of things. The first one is just to give you a little bit of background on property tax collection. As you know, well know, especially Earl, you would know that um, the, the county uh, collects all of the delinquent taxes after the township turns them over to the county for collection. So I, what I gave you is a little wheel here that has every step. There's one, you can kind of see one in the background, and it tells you all the different steps that we go through as we deal with delinquent property tax collection. Of course, what we want to do is collect those taxes, and then, um, um, you know, that, that helps all of us, you and, and the county, pay for the many services that we provide. So it comes over to us, um, and it's already been delinquent over at, the, at Grand Lake Township, and we have it for about a year. It goes, it's in a, what we call a forfeiture period. And then if we still haven't gotten the taxes collected, it goes into a foreclosure period. And we would be foreclosing on properties that are not collected now. You can guess that I don't like to do that. I'm sure that you don't like to do that either. So we do have programs to help people if they are going to try and pay their taxes and they still haven't been able to, if they've had some kind of hardship. So what I brought with me is a copy of the application that we have for people who may want to apply. There are, each one of you have one, and I've left some in the back along with this wheel um, in case people have questions. Feel free to co make copies if you come across people who might need our assistance. Make copies of this application. Our phone number is on the front of it, and the application is here. They can call us and make an appointment, and we will try and work with them if we can. It's also, the fees that are talked about in this little wheel and the interest rates are very high, and I know they are. And people always ask if they can, if I can do anything about that, and I cannot. It is state law. This whole process is dictated by state law, so it, it's very difficult for me to um, interject except for through the hardship program. The reason I'm really here, though, is to introduce to you Michelle Wildman. We're very lucky in uh, this county to have Michelle as our director of uh, the Genesee County Land Bank. She just, she's been here for a few months, and she comes from the state of Michigan. She's worked in various roles at the Michigan State Housing Development Authority and is great in terms of the fact that she grew up here in Genesee County. So she knows our community very well and she lives here. She's been living here and driving back and forth Lansing. But now she gets to stay right here. Michelle. Welcome. Thanks. Uh, mostly just wanted to say hello. We do have some property here in Grand Lake Township. Um, we also have resources that you could take advantage of. Um, we work to, I know we partner in a number of instances to um, bring various federal funds in. We're going to, I think, use some of those that we have access to to try to tear down a property here in Grand Lake Township. 
later this year. Um, we also sometimes get uh, grant dollars. We have some right now uh, that are open for um, to, to be used for like phase one or phase two environmental assessments on certain types of brownfield properties. Uh, they do not have to be land bank held in this particular program. They could be ones that the township owns, even private entities in some cases uh, through with various conditions on cost sharing and you know can't be somebody who contributed to the um, contamination. But different resources like that. So just wanted to um, come say hello, leave a few cards if you have things you want to talk with us about either uh, relative to the 40 some properties we have here currently or uh, things you would like us to help you address for open to those types of conversations. So I'll um, leave these for you and Absolutely. unless anyone has any questions. I have you, sure. Mr. Chair, sure. to Deb. Mm -hmm. uh, the county makes these? Yes. Um, do you, or do you want more? get the desk there for handouts? No. I've got a couple phone calls that actually this thing answers. I mean, if you could right. just hand this to somebody and it, it tells the whole... I'd be happy to give you some more. Yes. <coughs> I'm leaving this little pile here, yes. but we'll be happy, I'll be happy to get another box up to you. Yeah. You give this these a couple of years ago, I think, and yeah. I lost it. And this one here, I'm going to hang on. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad it's helpful. Any other questions? And I just swung down and picked them up. You don't have to. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Great. Same. Well, hopefully we'll be having a treasurer's meeting very soon. And uh, we can maybe give them to you there. I'm, okay. hoping, I hope they, I'm hoping it gets scheduled sometime in the first few weeks of February. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Yes. I think we want to make sure yes. that we've got our agenda in order. I just noticed that we, we skipped over. Is there a motion to approve our agenda? So hold it. So, I got a quick question. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Supervisor, it's maybe I have time to call you and I was playing phone tag today with Dennis, but when is the proper time to bring up about the uh, insurance and the compensation? Mm -hmm. Because probably under Mr. Laddie's report, I would guess. Sure. Because don't we have to do that with the budget? Well, you, unless you, I mean, you can put it, you can add an agenda item, or you can have a discussion. Uh, I'm happy to introduce the topic during the attorney reports, and you can ask questions and have discussion. Then. Just for, I'm sorry to, to Mr. Lanny. I was just concerned because I'm sure we have to increase the budget, right? Correct. Well, it will require an amendment. Any change that we make will, will require an amendment. We, you know, generally do them quarterly, but I mean, we can do it ahead of time. We do whatever you guys like. We bring it up under attorney opinion. Okay. Okay. So there's been a motion, a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, Mr. Limito, would you like to introduce our, our next guest? Oh, absolutely. Um, Thank you, Mr. Supervisor. The, the next guest we have, you're going to see a presentation. It's a follow-up we saw in December, kind of a conceptual plan of the Tech Village uh, area. And it's a project that, um, for everybody's edification, was really originally started back in 2007 as an opportunity to uh, develop an area in the township for knowledge-based employment opportunities. And it kind of turned into a, the idea of a mixed-use village concept. Um, you saw some of the conceptual plans that came out of the market assessment study, but tonight we're going to hear about the market assessment study from Howard Cohn from the Chesapeake Group who conducted the study for us. It, it, you know, when you look through, there's a, just a wealth of information. I think some of the stuff that get an opportunity to look through, you look at the demographics, you see uh, a workforce here that's not only highly educated, has a higher median income, um, but that just really highlights some of the opportunities, and you'll, you'll hear some of the statistics on why he can say with with uh, statistical confidence that um, what he has shown in, in this market assessment study is not only possible, but there's a market need for it here. And uh, with that, I mean, I just think that this opportunity is so exciting for Grand Wing Township to be a part of which kind of helps steer that southern end of development. And it's really for the region, not just Grand Wing Township. Um, and Jill, I don't know if you wanted to add anything beforehand or... Well, I will just briefly. Good evening. It's nice to see everybody. Jill Bain with Bishop Webster, Township Planning Consultant. Um, you may remember that in December we unleashed a whole boatload of information for you. 
on the Technology Village area. We talked about conceptual plans, we talked about the market study. Um, we wanted to reassure you that that wasn't the only time we're going to talk about this. Um, that we wanted to give you that big picture overview and probably on a monthly basis you're going to get additional information from us. So tonight we're talking about market information. Um, next week when the Planning Commission has its meeting and Mr. Ansor, you're going to be our new Planning Commission representative. Um, we're going to do that presentation again that we gave you in December to the Planning Commission next week. Um, and the, then the Planning Commission is going to start working on some zoning ordinance language as a framework to help support this vision that we have. Um, I also want to let everybody know that we are going to work with the township to get that conceptual plan as well as a short video that we put together for you before and the, the last master plan from 2012 which talks about the Technology Village um, a little bit further and we're going to get all that information on the township's website and so there'll be a link from the homepage. So for all of you or for all the folks that are, that are here maybe in the audience that want to get a little bit more information on what we talked about before or you hear something you want to look at it again. We're going to try and keep that updated as much as we can so that there's information available for folks. Um, and so I think that's all I have for you now, and I'm going to turn it over to Howard. Mr. Supervisor, would also just like to acknowledge and thank the Planning Commission members for coming out this evening to... Uh, yeah, could we have the, the members here that are part of our Planning Commission please stand? Thank you for uh, your service. We appreciate it very much. Mr. Chairman, before we begin, this is something that Ms. Bang just pointed out. If, if anybody in the audience is here for item 6A, that item has been withdrawn by the applicants. And so um, there's no point in having folks uh, sit around if they don't want to be here. Um, although, although they came like, on a good night. like people to stay and hear the rest of the information. The presentation, but <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody's here for the rezoning on, on Fenton Road uh, for the property there, that, uh, has been removed from the agenda. It was cool. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually been withdrawn, is that what I understand? Yes. So it, it won't be coming back under that uh, application. Correct. I'll have to move this. Hopefully everybody can hear me first off. I mean, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, I have a tendency to move around. Um, I was given, I have 10 to 15 minutes, so, and if not, then it's going to go like this so that you will see that I'm, I'm spending too much time. Um, one of the critical things that I think is really important is you had a project that's been presented to you again. You will see it numerous times again as it continues to evolve through the process and pieces of it get done is, can this happen? Always people say, well, I don't know that it can really happen. Can it he happen here? And the answer to the question is, yes, it can happen here because you have a number of things going for you. You have leadership within your community. You've already pulled your resources together and will continue to do so. You have a desire to make something happen. This can be a project which really is instrumental to you uh, in so many ways. Uh, you have a shared goal and you have a shared vision. Uh, as you go through the process, it's kind of like you need, you have a forest that you're building, okay? But it's one tree at a time. And you, as long as you keep that vision and keep that goal and understand where you're going, you'll be able to put those trees in the right place. Um, people will ask, well, have you seen this or done this before? There's two slides up there of a, a 2,700 acre park. Uh, that we were heavily involved with doing, uh -oh. <laughs> doing the feasibility work for Jill, can you get straight down? Um, the, it, and it is an education technology research park. It did not have the residential component of it. Uh, a project closer to home that we did the market analysis for that I think you're all familiar with. Uh, I've forgotten what his name is, but it used to be called Deer Park uh, for Grand Sakwa. Um, we did the market analysis for that also as well. So we've been involved. We've seen many projects like this and been fortunate enough to have been a part of them and projecting out what will happen. Why? What do you have going for you? You have the interstate access. You have, you have major arterials in the area. This particular site has your major employer, one of the biggest employers in the region. Um, you have a limited number of property owners who are on the same page, uh, and you have yourselves, okay, and others that believe in the future of this community and making something happen. Um, 
I need to put it in the context for you why the timing is so right now and why the opportunity is so good for this kind of project here. Um, and within that context, there are larger issues. One of them is demographics. For those of you that may or may not be aware of it, the population in the United States has changed dramatically. The birth rates are at the lowest level, the marriage rates are at the lowest level, the fertility rates are at the lowest level, and you've got a whole population out there that's huge as aging. We have two big population groups that are driving all markets, whether if it's employment or residential, and that is a group that is typically called the millennials, and at the other end, the baby boomers. Manufacturing, this is not a political statement. I've been telling people this for at least six years now, is returning to the United States. It's returning to the United States because we have mitigated the cost of labor. Transportation being close to the markets is a primary concern and a primary factor. That's why you've seen people like Warren Buffett investing in railroads and things like that, because we're going to be moving goods from place to place that are made here in the United States. Uh, that's been caused by robotics, new materials, 3D printing, all coming together. You've got, and I hope you're aware of the drone use and the emergence of that as an industry and as an impact on all of us retail. We know about the online growth of retail. Bricks and mortar will continue to exist, but it's going to be smaller and it's got to be mixed with entertainment. It's one of the great opportunities that we have here on this site is to be able to have that blend, is to have it a place that people want to come to because we know now that you can buy anything you want online if you're just going to buy something and many of us do that. Medicine is emerging very quickly using some of this technology that we've mentioned uh, and other things that are happening in that industry and that particular site is again relevant to that. The housing, you plus or minus 400 units per year, you permitted for a long time on average and you will continue to do that. The amount of housing that we're talking about is a small piece of that pie. For some of you that may not be aware of it, I hope that all of you are, we did a survey as part of this analysis of households in your community. 750 of your households responded. That's larger than any sample you've heard that's taken on anything across this country at any time in the past 10 years, okay? So the response is great. Those are individual households. So if you multiply it by two or three persons per household, it's a major portion of your population. And they told us a lot of things. We found out a lot of things about them, but they also told us that about anywhere between 25 to 50% may move in the next five years. And they told us what they're looking for in housing. Uh, once upon a time when you did a survey in an area like this, schools would have come out number one by a long shot. That's no longer true today. Those two population groups and being, being, being factors, neither of which are having children at this point in time. Some are past the age typically of having children. Some are choosing not to have it very, very early on in life. Uh, so 50% won't walk ability. Uh, that means all kinds of things in the kind of plan that you saw, again, takes that into consideration. Um, they want one floor, the, the principal bedroom to be on the first floor, okay? Again, age becomes a factor and other things that are involved with that as well. They are not adverse to condos, strong home ownership associations of that communal kind of setting where they don't have to worry about the outside or the exterior of the property for whatever reason. We then looked at the specific opportunities on this site and given the kind of housing that would be appropriate for it and we projected out the number of new housing units. Uh, that's in the analysis which I know that you've been given and we projected only 200 units over the next few years because it's going to take you a while to build up to have the infrastructure to find the right developer to work with you etc. And then it grows uh, from that point on and we only projected out to 2026. We also looked at the at the size of the units and the pricing of the units, uh, all within what are very reasonable. We came out, you know, there is no demand for single bedroom units. If people have a one bedroom unit, they really want a den or a second room that they can use for work or other life experiences. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Other opportunities that came out from the analysis very strongly, uh, fire insurance, fire, yeah. Uh, <coughs> Insurance and real estate, you know, the professional services areas, expanded medical opportunities. This 
facility that is on that site is going to change because they're all changing. Uh, they're absorbing uh, individual doctor's offices and a variety of things so there's a greater medical opportunity than what there was before and that's going to continue. And then we looked at projected manufacturing and R&D that are sp specific niches based on your labor force, based on your other activity you have going on in the area and there is, are things happening, for example, uh, Domino's, okay? We all know the chain from pizza. They're in the process of buying the technology from a California company where all of their pizzas are gonna be made using automation. There won't be anybody doing it. All the pizzas will, you, you'll get 10 pieces of pepperoni if you want pepperoni or whatever the case may be. That's in the works right now, it's happening. Somebody's gotta build that equipment and you're near major, major population centers and make it a reasonable thing to do here. Uh, so that's the food services robotics. Surgical robots, again, major employer connected to other uh, hospital facilities throughout the, the larger area, et cetera, and surgical robotics is becoming a big thing. Uh, I don't know if any of you have had any kind of surgery recently, but the chances are if they open you up, it's like a little bit unless they just went through your vein or cataract surgery where you used to put drops in your eyes and all this other stuff. It takes two seconds today. I mean, it's really, really changed a lot and going to continue. There's equipment that has to be built in order to be able to do that. Uh, robotic security guards, the same kind of situation. Drones. Um, it's just growing at phenomenal rates and the production of it has to increase very rapidly. It's going to be used to deliver goods and services. As you know, it's going to be used increasingly to protect this country in a variety of different ways, etc. So they're non-weaponized and weaponized drones that are, are need to expand that production very quickly. Robotic salespeople, quote unquote, okay. Uh, for major companies, it's going to increase again to the 3D printing offices, clothing manufacturing. The reason why you're going to see a shrinkage of an individual store, let's say that currently has 5,000 square feet, it's going to go down to 1,500 square feet. It's not going to go out of bricks and mortar, it's going to go out of existence. But it's going to shrink because they're no longer going to need to have the inventory. If you go to, to Men's Warehouse, uh, Joseph A. Banks, they're both related to each other. Now the first thing that hits you when you come in the door is they will produce your clothing just for you. Let them take their sizes, etc. Pick out what you want and that product will be made for you. That's the future, okay, of manufacturing for clothing and other things like that. And again, it will be done here. Um, Grand Blank, you have a variety of opportunities that came out to roughly for the R&D tech <coughs> industrial activity, 354,000 square feet. For the traditional office space, okay, that's for your professional, et cetera, and other activity like that, 60,000 square feet, or a total of 14, uh, 414,000 square feet. We are certain of these figures. If you came and you tell me that, oh, I think it's more than that, I would say that's plausible because I have a tendency to do very conservative estimates of demand, okay? But if you tell me it's less than that, I say, no, not true, okay? Um, from a retail standpoint, retail goods and related services, you've got internal demand as we build the housing. Those people need goods and services, and there's some unique characteristics of this community that you're building here. So we've got our local market that will generate 122,000 square feet. Another 230 from areas around us that will come here because of what we're creating from an environmental standpoint. And by the way, none of that has to be extracted from any existing business in the area. It is premised upon the housing growth which has occurred in your township for quite a period of time. Uh, examples of opportunities, full range of uh, food services. Again, that entertainment, when I say entertainment, I use it loosely, okay, as a terminology. Probably the first merger of retail and entertainment was in McDonald's, okay, way back when, when they first started to hand toys out to kids in order to entice families to come there. And then they built in a lot of them these little playgrounds that they had again. Then they added Wi-Fi, et cetera. Even firms like Pet Boys, they have elaborate lounges where you sit there. So what they're doing is merging the two together and there's lots of opportunities there too. 
How am I doing, Dennis? Okay. Um, so we're we've got we're up to uh, when you include the retail in there, you're up to about three quarters of a million <laughs> square feet of commercial space. This is space that has limited use of your services. None of it requires services over beyond what might be traditionally in an area at this point in time. Uh, but the unique components of this community are really important that will help to make this happen and are very much important and part of it. Over the next few months, you're going to be asked to review uh, zoning and other activity like that. It is critical that you get it right, okay? And it is critical that it be done universal for the site, okay? And not broken up into pieces uh, because the environment is a critical factor today. People want to walk around. They want to walk around the outside, whether it's winter or summer, okay? Walkability, that, those two go hand in hand, as well as safety, of course. They want to be able to play, live, and work in the same places. Your residents told us this. Other residents, we've done probably about 15,000 households in the Detroit, surveyed about 15,000 households in the Detroit metropolitan area in about the last year and a half, two years. We're finding a consistent pattern throughout that. The transportation network, which I'm going to describe a little bit more, is also is going to make you unique. The incubator activity for that R&D activity, it's small spaces. We're not talking about somebody coming in here and you know building a million square foot plant. You're talking small spaces, individual businesses that will work together using the modern technology and things that are happening that don't pollute anything, they don't take any more activity than, they, than your own individual house uses as far as utilities and other things like that go. But they're going to be design spaces and housing that will be technologically driven. Uh, and then there are entertainment venues, and I'll go into those a little bit more. I am getting towards the end here, so don't anybody pass. Um, the transportation network, a pedestrian system, is really critical. Going to combine it with the Ubers of the world so that if I want to go to downtown someplace, you know, whether if it's in Grand Blanc or somewhere else, I'm able to do that. Okay, I call up Uber or Lyft or one of these other entities that are out there. We might even have our own by then. Who knows? Car sharing, like zip cars. So if I want to go visit a family member two states away, I don't have to own my car. My cost of living is lower here because of that in this particular community. And then there are the uh, autonomous driving vehicles. Ali happens to be the one that's associated with any of you familiar with the IBM Watson computer uh, that is being used for lots and lots of things. Uh, again, Ali will be there so that people can, if they're not walking throughout your community, they can ride around very quickly, very efficiently, uh, in a very cost-effective manner. And then, of course, we'll have the ability to have traditional uh, modes of transportation. The design space for housing. The size of the house home, okay, we've already stated what that will be. It won't be small units. It will not be low-end units. It's going to be reasonably priced housing, but you're not talking cheap, okay, under any circumstances. Um, and I hate to use the word affordable, so I purposely avoided using it. Um, but you'll have internal electric electricity capacity in living spaces, and an abundance of the electrical capacity. Uh, you're going to be marketing for tech to, ro to robotics and 3D printing and young people and semi-retired people who want to get involved in that. It also includes crafts and everything like that. They're doing phenomenal things with taking photography and bringing it into 3D, 3D um, or three-dimensional activity. High-speed Wi-Fi routers throughout the village. If we can do that, the person doesn't even need that in their home. The technology is there. It exists. It's very affordable to put into place, and it can be done. Um, the club fitness, okay, the kind of thing that can be rehab, used for rehab by the hospital, but can also be used for the residents of the area. And try to maximize your climate control. It's been tested by the University of Michigan, uh, by Michigan State. There are things you can do here so that and you can have restaurants outdoors all year long, okay, with eating areas outdoors, etc., where people can walk around and they're not going to slip on ice on a sidewalk. This can be done as you, as you move forward in this project. Again, you chose the name of the thing, okay, and it is a great name given where we're going and what's happening. The incubator activity, one of the, the projects to your, to your right-hand side over there, that one is a jet engine, 
made by GE that is done by 3D modeling, okay, built here in the United States. Um, now, at the present time, not something that newer is happening right now. Clothing, I've already mentioned, they can do all kinds of crazy things. You've got, um, for, for somebody that needs a prosthesis of some sort, okay, that's 3D modeling, has cut the cost down to a minimal in that kind of activity, and when combined with robotics, with things they can do, you're able to control it totally in th ways it weren't. And as you may or may not be aware, but things like uh, vehicle, the, the way vehicles are built is changing dramatically as well. Um, I think I went backwards, and entertainment venues. I know that you have IMAX is somewhere relatively nearby, but that's not the point. The point is big screens, the kind of thing that people are interested in with the 3D uh, activity. It doesn't have IMAX, that's why I put it in quotes, because that is a particular name brand, just as Sky Zone is a typical name brand. But neat things that will attract people not only within this community, but outside the community and bring them in. Um, there's seven Michigan locations, for example, for Sky Zone right now, none that are right near you, okay? There are other options as well. Uh, top Golf, okay, so that you can practice your golf all year long here. Um, and so if you still decide to go down to Florida or Arizona or whatever for a few weeks, you're ready, you're prepared, you, you're constantly doing it, and there could be parties and training and lessons associated with it. The program is built upon economic policies that we believe were appropriate for the village. One is to hold the current residents within the county and the township. As they age out and as they get younger, as they grow, as they go to college or get some other kind of educational, and they finish, bingo, okay, you want to be able to keep them here. Continue to provide employment activity that meets the needs of the residents. Capture growth opportunities that will enhance short and long-term viability of the township and develop a unique project within the town, township and the county that really puts, gives Grand Blank a real name, okay, that people say, oh yeah, that's Grand Blank. What do you have to do to get there? There's a lot of little pieces. The ones that I want to stress is this should be done by a master developer, period, okay? That doesn't mean that they don't have a builder that comes in and does this part of it or that part of it. But under one plan, which you have, under one concept that you've agreed on, and one overall developer that makes sure that the pieces all fit together in partnership with you. Okay, this is a public-private partnership process. To get a developer in here, or even if we were talking about one of the tenants, there's a process that you have to go through. One is identify who it is that you're looking for and go and talk to them. Quote, unquote, you can talk to them through materials, etc. But the critical thing is that that entity that you're looking for may not be looking for something. You've got to put it in their face and in front of them because if they see the right opportunity, they'll seize it, even if they're not looking at this point in time. And they need to have the experience that you're looking for and the physical capacity to pull it off. Um, you can go through a solicitation process a variety of ways. We can talk more about that in question and answers if you want. There are marketing mechanisms that you need and what is the cost of that recruitment. Uh, I can give you some ideas based on our experience in other places. Uh, most importantly, perception is, is reality to, to those who hold those perceptions. There's momentum building. There are calls coming in. We need to keep that perception and keep it going, okay? Uh, and I'm going to start with what somebody might say, huh? Okay, this is the beginning. And this is the beginning of your future and carving out a very unique niche and a very unique development that from a fiscal standpoint will, will do very well for you way into the future uh, because it is future oriented. Turn the lights back. Yep. Take any questions. Thank you very much. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Cheers. Mr. Massey. Cheers. I have a question. Did you mention unmanned vehicles getting from point A to point B or point B to point E? Yep. Okay. You know, <laughs> people think it's crazy, okay? There are people who say, well, it may never happen in my lifetime. And you may still require a driver behind the wheel, okay? But 
it's happening, and there's a good reason why it's happening. People, this is not for strange reasons. Remember, and that's why I put things in the context for you, there's two population bases. Not to condone anybody, but at the younger end of the population bases, they're busy with their hands and talking and doing all kinds of things. The insurance companies don't like that. It causes accidents. Okay, So that vehicle has to be able to protect that person. As we have a tendency to get older, and I include myself in that group, you know, everything, don't, we always don't respond at the same speed that we used to, okay, to things. So we have to be protected as well. So it's coming along, and it's coming along really fast. There are certain companies, one of the major three big manufacturers in the United States, of course, says by 2020, they're going to have it ready for public to be able to do. Whether or not that happens, doesn't matter. The vehicles are moving in that direction. Okay. And there are the Ollies out there right now, okay? They, you know, maybe we can get a, get a test version of it here. Because Watson controls that. Watson seems to know what it's doing. <laughs> Any other questions from up here? Yeah, I was at a, a, MEDC, a meeting where the MEDC was today, and uh, a couple of things I took away from, from the meeting that uh, they were saying is that uh, one of the things that the local communities are going to have to do is, is figure out a way to develop programs like this, but then shepherding businesses through through the planning process so that when when we have an interested party in this development, that we're going to need to speed things along and, and streamline the permitting process. Um, that you know, businesses right now in, in Southeast Michigan area, um, there's a lack of distribution centers that. Uh, are over 70,000 square feet and they can't find anything of that nature and that uh, <coughs> businesses are looking for property uh, that's ready to go and that doesn't mean hey there's a there's an empty field uh, means that uh, that we've got the infrastructure in place but uh, from everything I gathered at the meeting I was at uh, that uh, things are moving this way from Oakland County because they, they just can't find any more space uh, for development so I think we're right, uh, you know, in my amateur opinion. So, with that, I think we'll open it to uh, public comment. <coughs> okay, we'll start over on the side of the room. Any public comment? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Please approach the podium. And yeah, sure. Please uh, give us your name and address. Yep, uh, Steve Bajorkman, uh, 4900 Meadowcrest Circle, Holly, Michigan. Well, Grand Lake Township, but yeah. Um, so I've got a question. So how did the whole process go? Because from what I understood is that whole area that they're talking about for this tech park was all zoned residential at one point. So is it is it a situation where they're trying to convert it from the residential zoning to a mixed use? I'll let uh, Mr. Lamada address that. You know, I'm not sure about when it was zoned residential because it would have been before my tenure here. Um, if, it, if the whole thing was zoned residential, and I don't know if you guys were here back then either. Um, Mr. Tubbs probably has. Something. I can lend something to that because we own the property, and uh, <clears throat> we purchased it in uh, 1993. And at that time, the property was zoned industrial. Uh, it was. There's been a, a lot of activity from some pretty substantial people to do developments in there, but it had mostly to do with retail and the township would not allow retail. Mattel and Development owned a piece in there and they had the, uh, the gentleman, he could tell you about that, and they uh, they had quite a plan and the township wouldn't do it. Uh, so therefore it reverted to research and development, which it is zoned research and development today. Okay. And has been ever since that we've had this property and the township has never varied one day from that. Okay. So is this, is it just an idea that, so it, obviously the idea, since it's always been zoned that way, is to actually finally develop it? Just because the market and everything else is sort of in the right spot, is that, is that correct? So this process really started in 2007. And uh, at that time they held a, uh, several meetings and uh, community planning activities around it to talk about a need and a vision. Um, because of the changing uh, realities that we live in, especially in Genesee County, uh, you know, with uh, General Motors jobs leaving the area, and what are we going to do to keep families here, keep folks here in, in our area? And so that, that conversation started coming about, well, what, what's the marketing need? What can we do to encourage that 
property to be developed. And that's kind of where the play of the seed, the conversation came together. A tremendous amount of work went together with many different uh, principal groups coming together and talking about you know, and it, it, what this should be. And at the end, it spawned this concept of a technology village, creating knowledge-based employment right here in our own community. And then what, was that, what will that look like? Well, for obvious reasons, the Great Recession came along and it was put on the back burner for many years. Last year, we pulled it back out, looked at it, spoke with the property owners, and said, you know, look at the possibilities that we have here. We've got it along I-75 corridor. We're next to the third largest airport in the state of Michigan. We've got, you know, I-69, 475. We've got just a crossroads of you want to get there, we can get you there. The opportunity is phenomenal. Um, and, and there's no secret that times are tough all over, right? And, and it's like, we've lost a tremendous amount of our taxable value. We're talking about putting a concept together here that could result in $100 million of increased taxable value into this community. That's revenue that we need to continue to move. We're at 81% of where we were before the recession, even though you heard about the new housing and the you know, construction that's right. come. So it's about developing a, a concept and then the marketing assessment study was done to see, I mean, we can put any concept we want, we can build Disney World there, but it doesn't mean people are going to come. The market assessment study tells us that people will come. We can look at this and say with confidence that this is not only a great thing to put into the community, but there's a market need for it in the community. 800 new jobs created there, multiple residential opportunities, retail, office space, R&D, and again, knowledge-based jobs for the community. And so it's really that's where we got to where we are today. The next step is it's going to go to the Planning Commission. Planners will be working on making sure that we have the appropriate zoning in, in place uh, as it starts to look. And what was said in the presentation, a major developer looks in and says, I can make this, uh, I can take this to fruition, I can make this a reality. We're talking about an 8 to 10 year absorption rate. This could be a reality in 8 to 10 years in this community. Okay, so it's, but it's predominantly, from what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, from the presentation, since it's going to be high tech and it's going to be, you know, more of advanced style and more, I think more what the millennial generation is looking for in terms of the way that they want to live with, you know, things close to walking, smaller homes, that sort of and thing. And seniors. And seniors. And seniors. Those are your two big population groups. Okay. Okay. That was a right. question. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. My name is Scott Morton. I live at 10304 Edgewater Trail. Um, <clears throat> I think my questions are probably for later on. It's how how is this going to affect my property taxes? And first of all, secondly, what is what are we looking at for development on Baldwin Road? Because it was uh, interesting with Grand Blank Road being shut down for its construction. Is Baldwin Road took all the and it still has all the hospital traffic, so it's, it's a very busy area. And third, I, every house in that my subdivision is a second story. So I'm a, what am I going to be looking out at out of my bedroom window? Is there going to be a parking lot with parking lot lights? Or am I going to be looking at, I mean, I see it has an evergreen property barrier, but how tall do evergreen property barriers go? I, you know, I kind of enjoy the fact that it's country living with, and it's pretty dark, and I can sit on my, my deck and enjoy the stars. But am I going to be looking through some trees at a uh, parking lot with parking lot lights? Uh, am I going to be dealing with an industrial area where I'm going to have them loading up uh, semis like they did have over there in Flint Township on Maple and Linden? Or that all night it's bang, 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 and trucks going up and down the road. That's what that's what I'm curious about, and I think I'm a little premature, but I just wanted to ask if any of you had considered that. Very good questions, and um, <clears throat> just so everybody knows, uh, uh, we invite everybody's questions. I'm not sure we're going to be able to answer all of them tonight, but if, if we can, we'll answer what we can. I think. Um, Dennis, would you like to speak to anyone? I can provide a quick response. What it's going to do to your taxes, I can't tell you. I mean, that I can't, I couldn't tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, I just don't have that kind of foresight. But um, I can tell you that there are buffer zones built into your property. There was a requirement when that property was sold that there's deed restrictions as far as buffer zones around that property. Uh, and when the Planning Commission and our planners work to develop zoning 
around our community and you take a look at our zoning map there's a lot of yellow it's primarily residential they've worked very very hard to make sure that we have a transitional phase there's neighborhood commercial that transitions away so that you don't you know we don't build factories next to houses um, okay. and that's certainly not the intention here it would totally defeat the point of what we're trying to do with a mixed-use village you heard what people want they want it to be walkable they want to be able to be able to jump on their bike and ride to work and stop at the you know brew pub on their way home for a craft beer and be able to walk and bring their kids and be safe i mean none of that would be conducive to what we're talking about so from your property there is a buffer zone there right. that will protect it from the kind of things you just inquired about uh, but what will the ultimate um, concept look like you're right it's a little bit premature yeah. I, i'm all for the development because uh, great i'd love to be able to walk over and go to the group up i'm in the aging group i'm retired from the sheriff's department i but i'm semi-retired because i've got jobs i'm going into that group where i guess the last of the baby boomers you know <laughs> and i like the fact you know i like the concept of let's let's be able to walk someplace let's be able to ride our bike someplace that'd, that'd be great as it stands right now that area is pretty sparse for restaurants and, and entertainment. But, like I said, is I, I'm ultimately looking at what my, what's gonna happen with my property and my, my uh, views, and et cetera. Like I said, I'm, I have nothing against development, trust me, that'd, that'd be great. It's just, I don't wanna look out my back, <laughs> out my bedroom window or off my, my deck and look at a parking lot, because it's gonna affect the saleability of my property on down the road, but. Uh, very good questions, and there, there's gonna be several steps between now and when this would take place, and uh, I think everybody understands your concerns, and we share them as well. Uh, Thanks, as, far as, as far as traffic, uh, we do have a few things that will probably mitigate some of the traffic going into the hospital with uh, uh, some work at I-75 and Holly Road this summer, and also widening the Baldwin between 75 and the Door Highway Extension. Door Highway Extension will probably take some some traffic off of uh, Baldwin Road, I would guess, uh, at least down by your area. Yeah, because right now they're shooting down Baldwin at right. 75 because nobody wants to deal with exactly. the bridge. So. Yeah, so that hopefully will alleviate that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. <coughs> Good evening. Um, my name is Adam Mohammed. I live in Monday Township. Um, I come from a regional perspective. Um, you mentioned MEDC, right? Yes. So, and we're in Genesee County. Um, so this sounds like a great thing, great development for Grand Blanc and Grand Blanc Township. But I'm also wondering if um, regionally, You've been having any discussions with other communities on how it will affect them. Um, because your dream here can affect, to a certain extent, negatively to other communities surrounding, right? Um, so regionally, it may not be the best thing for the county. Uh, I'm not being negative, I'm just wondering if those kinds of discussions as to understanding regionally what impact will have on other communities. Has that been part of the discussion? Uh, because if as a community, as a county, as a whole, we're not successful, then we'll be fighting among ourselves a little bit. So that's why I'm here today, is because even though I don't live in Grand Lake, um, I am an interested party from a regional perspective. So I'm interested in knowing your thoughts on that? Um, no, we didn't give an address. Your address, sir? Oh, my address. I'm at 5230 Windermere Circle. I'm sorry. 5230 Windermere Circle. Thank you so much, Mr. Um, okay, thank you very much. And um, I'm sure we are working with the county on this. And uh, as many of you may know, the taxable value of Grand Blanc Township actually uh, helps drive is part of the engine that drives Genesee County and um, I'm sure that that will continue to be the case uh, but I'm sure we'll be working with, with the Chamber of Commerce they've already uh, contacted us you know, for Genesee County um, they're interested in this project and, and supporting it actually so I don't know Mr. Lamont do you have anything you want there'll to be many opportunities for public comment again as we move forward this is a very early stage of this um, 
project. There will be uh, many opportunities with the Planning Commission, with the Board again as we provide updates to the project as we move forward. So your comments can certainly, uh, we've got Planning Commissioners here today, our uh, Planning Consultants are here today. So your comments have been heard and when the original stakeholders were all put together, they, were, they weren't just people from Grand Lake Township who were the original stakeholders to patch this concept. It was stakeholders from all over the region, uh, not just from Grand Lake Township. I'm glad to hear that. I, that's why I asked the question. I want to understand that. Sure, great question. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Brown. Good evening. Uh, Ed Brown, ED50 Pepperwood Drive, Grand Blanc Township. I'm also a planning commissioner. And obviously I was delighted to listen to Mr. Codd regarding the Chesapeake Group and certainly uh, been a, a long-term member of the Planning Commission, so we've been really waiting for this, and I, I'm sure I can share, uh, I, I think my uh, fellow members of the Planning Commission share my enthusiasm. I think with the leadership that we have from Giffels Webster, as well as the Chesapeake Group, I think it's time for us to hang a sign out that says we're open for business, and that we want business development, along with residential mixed development as well, so I'm excited about what I've heard this evening, and looking forward to working with all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Anyone over on this side of the room? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Please state your name and your address for the record. Yeah, my name is James Morgan. My address is 10107 Fieldway Trail. Um, I'm just curious. Um, you were very specific about uh, the types of businesses you want to put in, and I was a little concerned when I hear weaponized drones, um, as well as robotic security guards. It basically sounds like you want to build RoboCop right next to my subdivision. Um, <laughs> that's a little disheartening and concerning, um, you know, having kids and stuff. Is this something that you guys are actually going to look into? Is who can come in and what businesses can come in? Because that sounds a little scary to me. So I, that's definitely a question I have also. I, I share some of the concerns that some of the other residents do about uh, basic pollution, air, noise, you know, light also. So, Sure. Okay. Those are valid concerns. I think, um, again, our planning commission will be looking at all those issues. Uh, um, I don't think we're turning this into a, a uh, defense uh, department project. But, uh, <laughs> I think the idea is that, and it, you know, that uh, we're looking at technology, whether it's drones. I, I didn't hear the weaponized part. It was in there. It was in there. Uh, no, she sure, yeah. wouldn't have them flying around. It's a market for it, but you might not have it here. And you may not yeah. test it either. <laughs> that's, that's the more important so, part. But, but you know what, the, the concerns are valid, and we hear them. And, and you know what, the, the great thing is there are planning commission members made up of residents that, that live in our same neighborhoods. Um, I live in that area of the township and many of our other uh, board members involved, uh, people in our township, so um, we share your concerns and, and I don't think any of us want to develop something that, that we don't want to live with. Right. Okay. So, Thank you. Yeah. But we'll be addressing those concerns as we move through and you'll be invited to, to attend any of those meetings. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, this gentleman here in the front row. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Your name and address, My please. name is George Nahas. Unfortunately, I do not live in the beautiful township. Now I wish I did. <laughs> I represent the owners, originally, of the 127 acres that you folks are talking about. They are dear friends who we have known for 40-some years, and we are a family. I will be reporting to them the delightful words I've heard here and the degree of cooperation that I have seen in demonstration here with Jill and so many of you, Dan and, and Mickey, wherever she is, okay, there we are. I will report to them with delight. They regard this property as a legacy. We are listening and watching very carefully. We want this to be, as I have expressed to Mickey from the start, something we can be proud of. It's been in the family for at least two or three generations. Some of you know that. We're watching and we're listening. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Appreciate that. I, I want to make sure we get everybody before we go back over again. Anybody in the back row? Mr. Erd? Take me last, okay? Okay. Yes, sir. <coughs> My name is Joy Whitman. I live at uh, 1590 Meadowcrest Circle. And I just had a question. I know I've, I printed this out earlier today and I've been really looking at it over closely. Um, my question is regarding where it says an entertainment pavilion. Um, you know, my thoughts are I don't necessarily want to live right behind Pine Knob. So I, what exactly, I didn't hear anything in the presentation about that. Does anybody know what extent they're talking about a pavilion? It's really just a development concept at this okay. point, so it, it's not anticipated that it would be something like a big concert venue no, no, or something like that. Okay, no, it's very okay. No, no, can you no. <laughs> it to be okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it makes it a little easier. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the drawing is conceptual, and mm -hmm. we'll have to go through all of that. Sure. Okay. Anybody over the side of the room? You have one more question, sir? Yeah, just real quick. So uh, earlier you had mentioned the eight to 10 year plan. Um, so is that eight to 10 years till it's finalized or is that eight to 10 years until they start grading? So, so let, me, let me rephrase my question. So on an optimistic scale, if everything went according to plan, how long do you expect before to start breaking ground on it? Two years. Two years. And do you think that's a realistic expectation, two years? I do, and I'll tell you why. Um, when we, we uh, commission the market assessment study, it's to go out there and see what the reality of this is, because if that study had come back with different information, this would be a very different conversation. Uh, we're looking at, does, is it feasible? And what we found out is that absolutely, it's 100% feasible. There's a market need, this is what people are looking for. Uh, a lot of things have to come together for that to happen. You heard in the presentation a major developer um, is probably key to, to triggering the whole thing is that there's one point person behind it who will hire other contractors to do things. They'll look into it and they'll look, the conceptual plan that we have out there, you're looking at, that's exactly that's conceptual plan. We're saying these are the feasible things. This is what the market will bear if we want to put this in here. But a major developer could change that. It might not look anything that what's out there, but we know that it'll be residential. It's going to be a mixed village concept with walking trails, biking trails. It's the township's vision is that we, we uh, don't run away from those uh, water areas. Instead of water mitigation, we're, we're leaving them where they are. We're putting nature trails around them. It's, it's about that kind of a development. So it's going to take a visionary. Someone's going to have to come in and say, yeah, I want to do this. But is that possible? <coughs> Absolutely. Um, so they could be pushing dirt in two years or three years. Okay. What, um, you guys will make some sort of an announcement once that developer has been established or once you've sort of... You'll, like I said, we're in the very early planning stages. You'll see us going through. The zoning would be next, so our planning commissioners and our planning consultants will be working on making sure that we have the appropriate zoning, that everything's in place. We have our infrastructure for water and sewer planned. Uh, where the roads are going to be, and so we'll be working with developers who are interested. I get an email every day from somebody that heard about it and is interested and wants to know more information. Um, there's a there's a need out there, so do I think it will move? Yeah, I think it's going to be a reality. Uh, what it will look like in the end concept. Um, stay tuned. Keep coming to meetings. When you see us post about it, come to the planning commission and, and weigh in with the planning commission. Let them know your concerns or whatever. That's what they're there for. That's what they want to hear. Okay. Thank you. One of the things I think it's important to mention uh, is that uh, we're really fortunate to have property owners that are willing to work with the township on this. Uh, you know, that, that property, as was mentioned, was its own industrial. Um, we could end up with two big factories on that property in the past, and, and that'd be it. Instead, we're looking at having a planned community that uh, that meets the demand, demands <coughs> and needs and wants of our township. I mean, I. Uh, I see on Facebook whenever, you know, uh, there's a new business coming to town, the, the laundry list of all the businesses that people would like to see in Grand Blanc Township, um, all the, the stores that they would like to see in the restaurants and what have you. Uh, this is an opportunity to take a blank slate <coughs> and, and draw it uh, the way we want it to be. And so we're, we're very fortunate and I would like to thank uh, the property owners personally tonight and I think our board would or uh, joining us in this public-private uh, partnership 
to develop this property into something that can be a legacy for everybody involved, especially the property owner. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tobes. Any other public comment? Mr. Good evening, Ed Eric, 7212 Porter Road. Uh, I just want to say, you know, eight, ten years ago I supported the Tech Village, or still support it, it's a great idea. Okay, and hopefully everything works out good for everyone. I do want to move on though to, you all know, Parks and Recs and the Fire Department is something really important to me and important to the community. I was reading an article here in The View. And the article basically says the city had a meeting, Grand Lake City, had a meeting and wanted to, uh, I guess, thank their volunteers and uh, people that volunteer and do things and throw them a party, which I think is a fantastic idea. But it also says in this article that no taxpayer dollars will be used, but instead revenues via park rental fees will be used. I don't know if that's true or what it, but what it says is the same thing I've been telling this board forever. And the last board, the money is made in Bicentennial Park should stay in Bicentennial Park. It's part of this township. Also, uh, just for the heck of it, went to the Park and Recreation's website. They have uh, on their website minutes of their meetings. They have them several years back, by month. The last meeting posted is April 21, 2016. Apparently they've not been having meetings since then. Just, just amazing that it's just not there. So maybe you can look into that. You know, I still say that uh, Park and Recreation is kind of on the hand, taking on too many things, community education, saving the school board money. The board education belongs to the school, not the Parks and Recs. There's nothing to do with the park. It's for recreation, not education. Same thing with the Senior Center. Senior Center's got people that run the Senior Center. Why is it involved in Parks and Recs? So I think we really got to take a close look at this, this thing that's going on with Parks and Recs. The article really scares me. I want this to really, I don't want it to really get out of hand. I remember when um, the Park and Recs came to this board to ask for a millage. And they, and I want to call it a threat, it was a threat. We have to shut down fields because it's in such disarray our park. And one of the other trustees on this board asked, why are you coming to us now when it's so bad? Why are you asking for a millage now? Why didn't you ask us before? The answer was, we didn't want to interfere with the school board because they were having a millage on the last election. That tells you where their priorities are. And with our park, our park's falling apart. So I know this isn't all about this all about Tech Village. I'm glad I've got an audience this evening. This is great. But <laughs> Tech Village is very important, and I thank you for all your hard work on it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Any other comment? Okay. I think we're going to go to yes. Roger, I would like Mr. Lima to possibly to in, in look into the issue that Mr. Root brought up about where that fund is going to come from for that party because I have a problem with that if that's coming out of park rentals or as revenue to the city. And I, well, what I will do is um, I'll, I'll do some follow up with the city and we'll have a conversation about that as well as Kay uh, from Parks and Rec and uh, I'll get the information back to the board um, you know, by the next meeting. I just believe right now you will respond back to Mr. Er. Mr. Supervisor, to Mr. Er. could you get that information to me before the next meeting? Absolutely. Okay. With that, we'll close public comment. And how about if we take a, a recess of a few minutes in case anybody wants to? Uh, we'll, we'll recess for five minutes. <laughs>
to uh, resume our meeting at this time. Have a good one. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Lehman for putting together the presentation. And uh, I think we can see by the size of the uh, crowd tonight that uh, we have uh, quite a bit of interest in this, to say the least. So uh, I'm very excited, and I think our planning commissioner is excited. Look forward to meeting ball down the field a little bit on that field sign. With that, uh, I'd like to go to our second item on the agenda. Uh, let's see. Yes? I think we still need a motion, even though we have the letter from the developer, I think. Mr. Uh, Laddie would say we should have a motion on. We need a motion on, on the rezoning, even though they've dropped the request. Oh, I, uh, let's do it just for, for technical purposes. Let's just accept their withdrawal of their application. Is there a motion to accept the withdrawal of the application for the rezoning request? So moved. CC number 648. Support. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Item B, the board shall consider the request of Treasurer Guzak to extend the winter tax bill due date to February 28, 2017 without penalty. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Support. Support. Any discussion? Mr. Uh, yes, Mr. Supervisor. Uh, we do this every year. Normally the tax bills are February 14th, but we bring it to the board's attention and, and extend it to give residents a few more days so they don't have to pay with a penalty. Uh, but we want to reserve it at this point so that each year we do it at the time, just in case the board wants to raise it. So. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Item C, the board shall consider the recommendation of DPW Director Sears to award a three-year contract for a total cost of $26,197.08 to Maurer's Textile based on their bid of $167.93 a week, annual cost of $8,732.36, which includes DPW uniforms, shop towels, and mat service for the Township Hall and authorize the township superintendent to execute all related contracts and documents. The cost is, is included in the 2017 DPW budget and will be in future budgets. At the January 6, 2017 bid opening, only two bids were received. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Motion. Support. Okay, support. Okay, discussion. Yeah, I just have a question. I know that these mats are also in the police department. Is it, we're also, that's in the bid, isn't it? We're doing the police Match Sears? Also? No, that's not correct. The police department uh, does their own match through CentOS. Oh, okay. I just want to make sure we're okay. So. Yeah, it's a separate contract. Okay. They take care of it on their own. Okay, thanks. Do okay. yep. you have any comment, Mr. Sears, on that? Um, I don't. It's just a routine uh, contract that we've had for a long time, and just came time to renew it. We wanted to check our prices, so we decided we'd go out for bid. We didn't get the response that we wanted, but it just confirmed that we're getting a pretty good deal still from our, so. Uh, that's decided uh, the direction we want to go in. Well, I appreciate it checking anyways. No I have one more question. Uh, the cost on here is cost to clean? That is the rental of the clothing and to clean. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Yes. Jesse. I have a question. How often uh, are the match changed or clean? Bi-weekly. Every two weeks they, came, they come and switch out the mats. They come in, uh, switch out all the, there's like, um, I think, eight rugs throughout Township Hall that they come out and they roll up and they bring new ones. Weekly? Bi-weekly, every two weeks. Uh, well, I have another question, Mr. Chair. Sure. I thought you were going to say weekly. But no, not <laughs> weekly, no, sir. Twice a month. Well, what happens during the winter months when you're tracking in a lot of the uh, yeah, they, they still do it uh, bi-weekly. We do ask the cleaning company to keep an eye on them. And if they get too dirty, we ask them to vacuum them. Okay. But we still keep the bi-weekly schedule. Okay, thank you. No problem. Okay, we've got a motion and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, item D. The board shall consider a motion to approve the emergency repair of Holly Road in front of Merrill Lynch, utilizing the Fessler and Bowman of Flushing, Michigan for an amount not to exceed $28,000, including contingencies, and authorize the township superintendent to execute all related contracts and documents. These funds will be paid from the DPW account number 592-536-818. 
water contractual services. Um, would you like to comment on, on this, Mr. Sears? Sure. Um, unfortunately, these things never happen in a timely manner for us. Uh, as you can recall, probably in the press and from some emails going back and forth, we had a pretty severe watering break on Holly Road um, in front of the Merrill Lynch building. If you're not familiar with that, where that is, it's uh, right near Trillium Cinemas. Um, it, it was a very deep water main. Uh, it bores underneath the creek in that area, so it was ended up being about 15 feet deep. Um, we did have to call on an outside excavator to come in and dig it for us, and we ended up making a pretty big dent in the road there. So uh, we do have to replace the road to the road commission standards. This time of year, obviously, you can't lay asphalt. So we have to fill it with concrete. We also have to uh, excavate a portion of the hole back out so that we can make sure we have compaction, which we couldn't do in an emergency situation like we had previously. So um, the cost here is relatively high, but it's because we have to fix it now, put a temporary patch in, and then come back in the spring and re-asphalt it. So this is the entire project also to come back in the spring and re-asphalt. Uh, Mr. Sears, um, I was asked by a resident the question of, uh, in terms of liability, and, uh, since we're doing the work, well, number one uh, question was asked to me of why are we doing this instead of the Genesee County Road Commission? And then secondly, with the township uh, contracting for this work, are we assuming the liability for the work while it's being done or following that with you know, vehicles on the traveling? Sure. There? Um, we're, we're doing the work because we did the damage, basically. The Road Commission requires us to replace it. Um, other municipalities uh, that don't have a DPW like us, they may, the, the Road Commission may prefer to contract it out themselves. In this instance, I prefer to do it myself, only because the Road Commission um, can always find ways to make that bill a little bit higher. It, it's just easier if I have control of this process, I can keep costs under control. Um, so it's, it's a better process for me to bid it out and I have to go by road commission specifications and the contractor will be required to leave a bond with the road commission, uh, a maintenance and guarantee bond, so that they assume all liability for any repairs or uh, anything that happens during the project. Uh, so we're covered under the contractor's liability insurance and the maintenance and guarantee bond. So yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, you know, we're doing the right thing here, okay? Sure. I mean, it, it, it's something we have to do. Yes. Um, it's, uh, in all my years on the board, somebody had to remind me of another instance where, where a water main break caused right. major highway damage that we had to go back and So, So the good news is this isn't something that happens frequently. Okay, so, but, but, but does anybody on the board see the irony in the fact that the county is requiring us to expeditiously uh, fix this road to a high standard while driving around rambling and see how well the county's doing with that okay so i just find that very ironic but we're doing the right thing here don't get me wrong i, I share your same sentiments and i did communicate that to them <laughs> as they were telling me what we had to do um, I, we, I wasn't happy, trust me, but it is their road, it is a major highway, and we do have to construct it to their standards. So. Now, one of the things that uh, may not be apparent is that uh, when we have one of these water main breaks, it, it does cost us money because uh, that water yes. is obviously is running, and the sooner we get it located and shut off, Absolutely. Uh, the more money it saves. And, uh, Mr. Lima, I don't know if you want to mention how we found this, but... Uh, I mentioned earlier today in the executive officer's uh, meeting with David Laddie that uh, one of the things that I think that was important for the board is that, you know, we have put systems in place over the years to make sure that we can detect leaks when this happens. So, I mean, we're buying that water from the county, and the more the water that leaks, the more we pay, even though it's just going into the ground or running into a creek. And one of the things that um, I think was important to highlight is just the fact that Maria Hobson, uh, in her job uh, with the DPW, is uh, the reason that we located this leak as soon as we did is because she had notif noticed it and brought it to the attention to go check it out to see why we were losing water in that particular district. And um, I think it just shows that the programs that Jeff's been working to put in place, 
with the leak detective systems, the things that the board has approved over the last few years, it's working. You know, we, we're trying to get it down to the acceptable percentage of water loss. We're never going to have it at zero. We're always going to lose some water, but it's being able to de detect things like this and that just staff, it, it's working. The system's working the way it's supposed to. Absolutely. Yes, Mr. Matthew. I have a concern. What's currently going on now? I've passed the area many times, and it seems like there's no activity. Where at? This oh. is on Holly Road. This is on where the construction is now? Yes. Well, it, it, nothing's happened because it hasn't been approved by the board. Uh, once, you mean as far as this repair? This repair. Yeah, the water main has been fixed. It's it, it's repaired now. We can't repair the road. I couldn't repair the road until I brought it to the board. Oh. Is that, is that fair game? Because I'm thinking if something occurs a little worse than what sure. happened there, how would you handle that? Well, and, and we do have provisions in our purchasing policy where we can make the emergency repair. It's taken us time for one to find a contractor that is able to do all this work this time of year and get it done quickly. Um, we have been working on that diligently. It's taken us time to work with the road commission to make sure that we're doing this to their standards. So uh, it just happened that we got the full bid price back um, last week and I decided instead of making the emergency purchase that we could wait a few more days and bring it to the board for your approval so that you could make the decision. One comment. Sure. I don't think very highly of the road commissioner. Right. That's my personal uh, experience that I've seen things go wrong and I don't think the road commissioner is stepping up to what he should be. I think it's a he, yeah. He should be doing. Mm -hmm. He's liking in every area. Sure. That's my uh, assessment. You're a great addition to the township. <laughs> 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 yes, Mr. Thomas. Uh, Mr. Supervisor, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the emergency repair not to exceed the twenty-eight thousand dollars, including the contingencies. Okay. Got a motion. Second. Mitt, discussion. Discussion. Go ahead. Mr. Massey. What happened, uh, Mr. Chair, if if you run into a problem and you have to exceed the twenty-eight thousand, you have to come back. Um, the purchasing policy gives the superintendent uh, authority to uh, a percentage of overage on that. Oh, okay. Um, I. The 28,000 has some contingencies built into it, and I don't foresee any uh, reason that it should go over that. The only reason I said that because of the winter months. Sure. Doing yeah. the summer is a little different in my, yeah. Yeah. my well, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you raised that because yep. uh, you don't want to not be able to do the job because it comes in for one dollar more. Yes. Absolutely. And this was all bit. This was all uh, the contractor knowing the conditions out there, the weather that he's going to encounter. Uh, we expect him to honor this price because he knows the job he's been doing. So, Mr. Yes, Buck, in the event that were to happen, Trustee Massey, and something catastrophic happened and we had to do an emergency repair that was to exceed this, because the board has passed a motion not to exceed $28,000, our purchasing policy would still allow me to finish this job if it was an emergency situation. At that time, an email or communication would go out to the board to alert you that even though we have a motion not to exceed $28,000, an extreme contingency came up in my judgment. It was an emergency response that we had to repair. It cost this much more, and you would get that information um, before that we got to the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Supervisor okay. Yes. You asked a question about why we need to do this. I'm not sure that it was fully answered, but uh, my understanding is is that the repair of the road is because is collateral is repair of collateral damage to having to fix the main that went underneath it. And as I drove by that, it, uh, the opening in the road seems to be about what 12 by 12 or something like that. It's something like that. It's, it's yeah. 12 so, by 12. Yeah. So it seems like it's a lot of money to repair that, but it's actually. Everything underneath it, it is, is the, uh, the issue. Correct? re excavating, recompacting, all the construction testing, and then all that aggregate's got to be put back in. We have to replace stone and then 12 inches of concrete and the, the curb. We have to replace curb. So, in terms of why we're not doing more replacement of fixing the roads, right. it's because it's not our responsibility and replacing absolutely. this one because of the underlying. Because, yes, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Because we <coughs> tore it up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We tore yeah. it up. Okay, for any other questions or concerns? 
Okay, is that all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, item E. The board shall consider the training policy for employees. In 2009, the board developed an internal practice that only the board of trustees can approve out of state training requests. And uh, the question this evening is does the board wish to continue the practice and formalize the policy or allow it to be considered within the superintendent's funding authority? Mr. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm going to make a comment that I'll. I'll I don't know if it would be too if it'd be premature to make a motion following that comment, but uh, so, as everyone knows, you know, Grand Lake Township went through quite a economic. Uh, all communities did. Uh, you know, it wasn't just a, a county, state, or a, it was the it was the United States, right? But but uh, it, when I got back on the board, we were facing a huge deficit from uh, the decline in property tax value or, or the decline in revenue, I should say. And the board took some actions then to, uh, uh, to, to cut expense. Uh, and one of them was, without probably deeply looking into the, you know, whether, whether out-of-state uh, training was more than in-state training kind of a thing, but, but it was a general belief then that out-of-state training cost more. Okay, so one of the things we did was just say, all right, right off the bat, we're, we're stopping all out-of-state training. Okay, and then there was a lot of other actions that was taken to, to try to make up that six hundred thousand dollars. Well, what I'm saying is uh, uh, that was the reason behind that policy being in there, or the, the the majority of that reason. So, I think it's it's a it's not a policy that we should just disregard and, and just go wild here. But but I believe it's it's uh, we're st we're stable. We have some stability now. We have some uh, frugalness in the in the whole budgetary process that. Uh, I think maybe uh, through the uh, your, yourself and the superintendent, where, where there are trainings that we that the employees uh, need, and it would benefit the Grand Lake Township community as well as this board. That that this maybe this there's a time to lift this policy. This is the time I'm making a motion yeah. to do that. Okay, you're making a motion that we go along with the spending limit for use room pre present policy for spending limit on training and the procedure for that except the out-of-state uh, portion uh, can be removed now. Mr. Chief. Yes, Mr. Massey. Uh, I have a question, I guess. I'd, I'd like for my question to be directed to uh, the superintendent. I don't have a problem with what's here, but I have a concern about what is the cap. Now, here's what I'm thinking. I'm not saying I don't trust you. But if something happens five years down the road and you're not here, then we get someone in here that may overspend. So shouldn't there be a cap? There is. Huh? There is. Go ahead. What is the cap? Uh, when we have budget development process, Mr. Massey, we, oh, okay. the department heads as well as Mr. Lehman, to brings those, the forecast for that year for you know trainings, and, and we budget that. Okay. okay, so what we're saying is that we've discussed it, we have adopted the budget, and now, Mr. Superintendent, you're, you, don't, you, know, and you don't have to bring this to us now that with, within the budgetary, uh, the line items of the budget, but, but he was bringing it here because it said, because the training was out of state. And so now he would just be able to follow the, the, process, the, the policy as if it was in-state training. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like yes. to respond to that. Sure. I wasn't questioning that part. I was questioning the cap. The cap is not stated. The cap is the budget. We, no, we adopt that. He's got two caps, though. Right now, in your purchasing policy, board adopted purchasing policy, it directly discusses education and training certifications, right? So, in that policy, it says that all educational uh, trainings will be pre approved by the superintendent within my spending limits. I have up to a $10,000 spending limit. Oh, okay. Now, when you look at any specific line item in any of our department budgets, you won't find, for the most part, a $10,000 line item on training. Now, when you look at the police department, however, you've got you know 50 people working over there that require much certification and ongoing training. Now, they have a much bigger budget you know, than yes. the $10,000 spending limit, although they don't go up for $10,000 trainings either. Those are all, you know, within that limit. So when the budget comes to you and you'll see the budget process, and I, I, 
it's come to my attention that you guys didn't get the uh, narratives in the budget that you got when you started, when you came on board here. And so I'm going to send you all of those and just they, they belong within your budget packet. So in each department there's a narrative that describes to you uh, the conversations that I've had with the department heads as we move the budget forward. And you'll see my overall narrative, you'll see theirs. Some of this does get addressed in there. But you know, the, the, right now there is a training policy. It's in the purchasing policy. It is within my limits. Department heads can approve up to $2,000. I can approve up to $10,000. But all of that training has been pre-approved or pre-built into the budget process. Now, if somebody came in because a great opportunity came up, and they said, man, I've got a training for $3,000, but it's over here. Would we consider it? Absolutely, if it made sense and it was going to further our, our uh, goals. But then if that were to happen, it's going to require a budget amendment, in which case I'm going to have to come to the board and during our budget amendment say I'm going to move $3,000 to the training line item under DPW so that we can do this training and we're going to take it from you know another fund or another line item. So you would be approving those if they were outside of the budget process. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yes, Mr. Ramsey, Mr. Supervisor, I do find it a little bit curious that um, that we chose that the previous board had chose to um, designate out of state training as a as a catch point rather than just a cap on the on the um, on the amount of the training. It just seems like it's. Um, uh, seems that there may have been something more involved. Yeah, I'd like to comment. Comment. Actually, we stopped the out-of-state training and we stopped all training. Yeah, okay? that's true. Okay, well, we were only, but we we stopped all because it's a great point. If you run around of money, you can't have any training. So we did stop it all, but we carried over the other part. The biggest part was because we had our small trainings now. People have gone out. We still didn't want the out-of-state. What year was that, girl? It was 2008. So it wasn't this last board. Right. 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 No, right. Right. But it's a great point, and so it's all training. I mean, if money is money for training. Right. So it's either you can afford it or you cannot. Right. And we couldn't afford it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the out of state. I mean, it was even worse because we had people going to Vegas, and it was like too much money. Okay. Thank Thank you. Way too much. You had a comment? I was just wondering is it really that big of an issue to come in front of the board and ask for funds to, for out of state training? Just no. Out of state. It, that's a great question, and, and no, it is not. If the board wants to continue that, I just want you to formalize the policy because right now what occurred is it happened at a board meeting. So we don't have a policy that says out of state training policy. What we have is a board, a conversation that took place at the board that became a practice versus a policy. So if the board wishes to keep that they want to approve all out of state training because it only comes up once every year or whatever. I don't have a problem with it, but I would like you to formalize the policy then so that I can work within policy because right now it's, you know, it's not, it's a practice, not a policy. And I don't want to get caught in a catch 22 here where, oh, you forgot to, you didn't come to us before you approved that training that was in Ohio. Um, I, I just want to make sure that there's none of those that, that we're all on the same page together. So it's a great question. I, I've got a couple of comments of my own. Uh, number one, is that uh, we trust Dennis to, to make decisions for our board. Um, some pretty substantial uh, decisions, you know, not just uh, travel, but uh, he makes, he signs documents, he hires individuals that, uh, you know, the liability for those issues could be huge. Um, we're trying to raise the discussion level of our board to beyond daily operations and we've, we've hired an individual that we entrust a, a lot of uh, decision making to him. Um, I, I want to make sure that our board stays focused on things like Tech Village and where are we going. Um, training, out of state, you know. I, I could go to a seminar in Mackin Island that's a lot more expensive than one in Toledo. Um, so the out of state, in state really kind of a you know, red herring. Mr. Kent? Yeah, just to piggyback on that, Mr. Bennett, that's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, right now, the, the superintendent can send somebody to one week to Grand Rapids for $1,500, but can't send somebody to the DPW director to, to Toledo for one night for 250 bucks. And I don't want to have a 200, if, it's, if we've reviewed it at budget, if we've reviewed it, uh, it's been presented through the uh, uh, explanations that Mr. Lehman has, has, has indicated today, 
I, I don't want to. I, I do want to entrust him to, to put the training and, and, and send the employees that need it and, 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 and be discreet about where the where the training is. Well, the other thing, excuse me, the other thing that goes into this is a cost benefit analysis, and I'm trusting that our, our superintendent does that. Um, we're, we're holding him accountable to achieve certain goals that we, we we're going to put out there and a roadmap of where we want to go. If his hands are tied, how can you can't hold somebody accountable if you don't give the authority? Um, and uh, I, I want to make sure that our discussion is is at a higher level. Um, he's doing a cost benefit analysis on everything that, that he does, or else we wouldn't have him doing the job. So I would I'd support Mr. Kemp's uh, motion. You made a motion. Yes, was it seconded? Yes. This one? No, no. Okay. Support. Okay, we have support. Any other discussion? All in favor? So, so could we have the motion one more time, please? Read the motion. The motion is to remove. Uh, to go along with our spending limit? Is to remove the out of state training uh, verbiage, if you will, or word wording from the training policy. Is it the training policy or just the spend limit policy? I think if we adhere, if we say that we adhere to that policy, or do you suggest the training policy per the purchase policy in effect? Okay. Okay. Is what he's saying. Right. Mr. Right. Laddie, would you like to clarify how we could word this? Just that if we adhere to the training policy consistent with the terms of the purchase policy that's currently in effect, yeah. that, yeah. that, that I think right. meets what you're looking That's what I said. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I got that from that. <laughs> Very clear and concise. All right, everyone clear? All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Okay. Um, item F, the board shall consider a motion to approve the superintendent's request for a wage increase for administrative assistant Megan Gilman based upon her 2016 performance evaluation. Ms. Gilman's contract was approved in June 2016. Uh, Mr. Lehman, you guys saw the um, transmittal that I forwarded to you in regards to this, and um, just as a refresher uh, for the board because we have a new board, is that that um, performance evaluation I instituted last year uh, in the township. It, we put it in every January. We review all contracted employees. We do not currently do performance evaluations on any represented employees, um, but we do do them on all independent employees and. Uh, Ms. Gilman was hired a year ago. Uh, I'd asked the board to fall, you know, prior to that, like in November, I think was approved uh, the year before, to uh, allow me to hire an administrative assistant. The board at that time approved it, uh, the expenditure up to $40,000 a year salary plus full benefits. Um, and that's what we had budgeted in for. Uh, we had 41 applicants for that position. And when we took it down to, uh, uh, Megan Gilman was the you know had had come through and uh, and won the uh, opportunity to take the position. There's a couple of things that we knew about her is that she had been working with um, Supervisor Hoffman as a part-time employee, so I was familiar with her. We also knew that uh, she um, it certainly was capable of the job. She had performed uh, the interview process very well. And uh, I will admit that there was also a cost savings because I was able to get her for considerably less money than um, the other candidates at that time and give her the opportunity to prove herself in the role of administrative assistant. Uh, Ms. Gilman has performed uh, very adequately. In fact, her overall performance evaluation on the 13 metrics that you saw, um, her overall would be consistently performs above expectations. Uh, she, you know, she's still, uh, yesterday she was out taking a learning in Excel because I do a lot of work in spreadsheets and it's you know it's something where she's uh, got a, a, an air of continuous improvement she she works to do something and um, so why I recommend the salary increase that I'm recommending uh, is is it a, a sizable increase yes but it also puts her up where the budgeted amount was and that is in the budget this year at forty thousand dollar salary um, what it does is it places her from an internal comparison so that the board would be able to understand where we value that position in our whole scale, wage scale of things, would be the same as a clerical two one year for our representative employees. So what's the difference between a clerical one and a clerical two? Well, a clerical one typically um, 
obviously a lot less job responsibilities and duties. Clerical too, they become a little bit more specialized in their duties and they take on more responsibility. Currently in this position, we have two cashiers who are clerical ones. We have one cashier who's clerical two. Why is she a clerical two? The board changed that last year to give her the response because she was taking on additional responsibilities in the treasury department for collections, for training, other new cashiers, things like that. So if you look at the internal comparables, it's where um, I'm making the recommendation on her increase, we'll put her in an internal comparable position uh, to that level of responsibility. She's not gonna be covered by the union, correct? She is non-union. Okay, are we, again, Mr. Supervisor. Yeah. Um, are we gonna have a contract written out like we do already for the other two non-union represented? She has a contract, um, much like all the department heads in mind, it's fashioned in the same way. And this, your uh, administrative assistant, is she's the one that you share with Supervisor Bennett? That's correct. I'd like to make a motion that we uh, accept the motion and increase the salary. No support. All in favor? Oh, that's you. <laughs> Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. With that, uh, we went to uh, item seven, board discussion items. Uh, one issue that uh, Mr. Uh, Massey and Mr. Mansour actually attended uh, recently the uh, uh, training for new government official, new township officials, and uh, Mr. Massey, uh, would you like to uh, talk a bit about your experience at the class at all? I know all of us have uh, this handout in front of you. Uh, can I give you one yes, I think those as well. Okay. Yes, uh, that the class uh, took place on January the 20th in Ann Arbor, Michigan. One thing that I noticed. Uh, it, you probably should have on page 30 of the MTA handout that you have. There's a uh, township, as uh, a charter township organization chart. And they put quite a bit of emphasis on the organization chart during the class. Uh, the clerk reports to the uh, township board. The deputy clerk reports to the uh, clerk. The treasurer reports to the township board. The deputy treasurer reports to the treasurer. Now, it got very tricky here when it came to the supervisor based on the, the charter township organization chart. The, superin the superintendent reports to the supervisor. And this is one of the major problems that we probably never thought of. The responsibility of the supervisor is 24 hours. Supervisor receives calls any time of the night. He has to res respond to whatever dentist decides at wh whatever time of the night or morning that dentist, uh, the superintendent decides to call the uh, supervisor. So that's a 24-hour job. But we've never really been told that. You know, we make an assumption that his value is less than what we think it should be. But attending the class, his value is much greater than we think it is. So we consider it. The supervisor and superintendent are the only two that should be responding to any complaints about the operation of the township. Anyone else who chooses to do so is acting out of order and without authority. That means that the trustees cannot engage in any authoritative conversation with anybody. Now, I can, I can tell the guy from uh, uh, WP, what is it, WPW? DPW, sorry, DPW. I can tell him my opinion, but I can't tell him that whatever the supervisor or the superintendent has advised to him, I cannot tell him that's not true. I can say this is my personal opinion, but this is not the board's opinion. So sometimes we don't know that. Sometimes someone, you know, when you're out in the community and someone asks you a question, they say, well, this is what I heard, and you may say, that's wrong. You're acting out of order. 
because you don't know what has been said from the point of view from the uh, supervisor or the superintendent. So we have to be very careful. And those were some strong things that I learned. Also, the trustee, trustees really have one power, and that's to vote. That's the biggest power the trustees have, is to vote. Uh, we got a couple of departments that we got to pay much more attention to. It was brought to, uh, it was brought to our attention during the class. That's the fire department, the joint fire department that we have. There should be clear policies and procedures. There shouldn't be no guesswork at all. Not what I think, not what they think, but we should have clear policies and procedures. Now, the procedures that and policies that I view, I don't think they're clear enough. I think they have a lot of things that are, are not written and a lot of things that the other side may do that we disapprove of because we share the responsibility, not the other side. So if there's a, a big liability, so- Mr. Master, you're saying one of our, our other partner, just because I want to clarify, when yes. you say the other side that you're talking about, because it's a joint between the city and the township, you're yes. talking about the city. Yes, okay. speaking of the city, because we share most of that expense, and we should have some procedures and, and policies, and policies and procedures in place to respond to whatever comes up in the future, okay? So no entity should act independently of others. In other words, I mean that the uh, city should not act independently of us. The city should not be able to make a decision unless and they consult us first, and we agree. And that's why we need these policies and procedures in place to spell all of that out. Same thing about parks and recreation. We need stronger procedures in place. I don't think we have stronger procedures in place. Because when I came on, when I, when I came on as a trustee, I did uh, go to the parks and I talked to a few workers. And uh, I had some concerns about what they told me, how the parks are being managed. They're being managed from based on what they told me, okay? Without us having basically any input. 18%. Oh. <laughs> so, so we need to rectify that uh, going forward. Sometime in the very near future, we need to come up with some real concrete uh, policies and procedures. The other thing that we learned, and it came up in a meeting when the uh, finance director was here, Okay, about audit, audit reports. Every audit report should be brought to the board, yeah. Yeah. and it should be reviewed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and those audit reports should be reviewed prior, uh, frequently to see has they been rectified. Okay. Yeah. Now, the reason I say that because I think the the uh, chair asked a question. Well something about the previous audit report. And it appeared to me that it wasn't clear whether we had received or reviewed that information. You mean an audit of the parks, an audit of the fighters, that what you're saying? Yes, all okay. of them. Okay. Anytime there's a financial audit, audit of the parks, audit of the fire department, all of those audits should be uh, mm -hmm. brought before the board. Yeah, that we need to receive them. We appreciate that. Yes. yes. Thank you. Anything else? No. Sounds like uh, you had a full day and uh, picked up a lot of information. And uh, you know, even the audit information, even though we do that, yeah. uh, it's great that you know that because uh, you know we don't want to assume that board members know every you know role that, that they play. But Mr. Chair, I'd like yes. to ask Mr. Mr. L. Does he have any comment? Mr. Mansour, here's going to be next to my list. Mr. Mansour. Okay, so uh, the board uh, and uh, and uh, superintendent, I think uh, Mr. Landa received a, an email from you over the weekend uh, with some of my observations about that, so I won't go through those in total, but there are uh, two or three of them that I would like to emphasize. First, um, uh, I do appreciate going to that. I think it was a 
well-organized session and uh, for a full day really got a good introduction, although it was just kind of the first step. Uh, the second uh, is that one of the things that I uh, came away with was how important communication is. It was one of the sessions, one of the topics about that uh, communication between board members uh, with the staff, which is part of what uh, uh, Trustee Massey was talking about, um, and uh, also with the public. So um, those are some things to, uh, to think about that I certainly will, will be thinking about. Um, one of the uh, items that I uh, was uh, kind of reflecting on as they were talking about the number of boards and commissions that the townships typically authorize is uh, to make sure that uh, the people that are, are taking those positions have a good understanding of what their expectations, responsibilities, uh, frankly, what their liabilities and immunities are. Uh, so I think that that's, um, that's an area that I would like to see. Uh, if we have something on that, I'd like to see uh, it. And if we don't, we should, I'd like to see something maybe a little more formal. Um, and then going back to, again, uh, Trustee Massey's uh, point that the uh, trustees have uh, the main power of the vote, uh, but also uh, we uh, can take it upon ourselves to influence and become experts in certain areas. Uh, and that adds, uh, adds to the value we bring to the board, too. So that's um, something that I took away. And then finally, I just have to get a little bit more familiar with MCL 42, which is the charter uh, township, um, I guess, law or... Uh, portion of the Constitution, um, because that's, uh, that's key. That's uh, what, what we're all about here in terms of what we can and, and cannot do. So again, I thank the board for uh, enabling uh, and the, uh, for us to go to that, and I look forward to a follow-up training when we can get into the schedule. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, I encourage anyone to attend one of those uh, training seminars, uh, veteran or, or new board member. They're, they're very worthwhile. I have attended them in the past. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, Superintendent Lehman. Do any items? Well, just for so the board knows uh, kind of what's going on and what you're going to be seeing um, shortly, we do have a schedule put together. Uh, I did talk about it when we first came together about um, the various departments will come and do a brief presentation. And by brief, I mean even briefer than Howard was this evening. Uh, because he was about seven minutes longer than I begged him to be the <laughs> longest possible time he could take. However, uh, apparently somewhere he bogged down in the middle. Um, but uh, just so you guys know that we will it will start those off in February. Usually they start in January. We tend to do them at the committee of the whole meeting and they'll come in and the uh, board members who were here last year saw them as we went through. These people have been practiced now. We'll start with uh, Parks and Recreation at the Committee of the Whole in February. So we'll have the opportunity to explore some of the um, questions that the board may have, and certainly Trustee Massey has raised, and you know it's a good opportunity to have uh, Kay will be here as the Director of Parks and Rec. She'll do about a 10 minute presentation on uh, who they are, what they do, her staffing levels, her budgeted amount, and what they're all about, and then open it up for Q&A so we can get some of those questions answered. Uh, normally, we'd only do it at, at Committee of the Whole, but I've asked FIRE to come in and do it on the meeting of February 28th. The reason I'm doing that is because we're going to have a joint city uh, commission township board meeting in April, and I really want to get parks and fire before the board before we have those, because I think it's critical that you guys have the opportunity to see those presentations. Then in March, you know, we can have those <coughs> conversations about if there's any issues that we want to straighten out when we meet together in April. So it gives us time to work on and you guys can formulate your strategy for you know how to lead those discussions and we can strategize on the agenda items. Uh, but so you'll see those two in February and then we'll go down the list with DPW assessing GIS and so on. Uh, but every month you'll see somebody in here, one department will come in and they'll do their 10 minute PowerPoint presentation about who they are, what they represent. And I, I would have liked to have done assessing sooner, but we always give them a buy until they get through the March board of review because they're very busy up until that time and March is, is critical for them. So they will be here in April. I like to do assessing because I want to make sure the board members know that without assessing, no money comes in. So these guys are pretty important to us, that uh, office off the corner here. And I think it's good that you guys get an opportunity to see the faces of those folks and what they do and understand because there's a lot of changes that have taken place over the last few years with the State Tax Commission. Uh, but we'll, we'll kick those off. Um, as I said earlier, we're in the middle of employees' performance reviews. I'm still waiting on, I think, three of them. We will 
go through that process. It will be finalized before the February meetings. Uh, last year we did it as a slate and had everybody's done. They came in and made my recommendations uh, down the line of all of the other contracted employees as far as if there was going to be any uh, requests for wage adjustments. Um, I'm not sure if we'll have them all done and do that this year or if they'll be separated more. I did Gilman sooner because she was done and ready and I wanted to move on that, but I know Jeff. Jeff turns his in about 30 seconds after I hit the send button. Like he's already got it written before I do. I'm not sure how why he's so quick, but he loves getting reviewed. So that's, a, that's what's on the plate. And of course, the, the um, Tech Village project, we're going to keep working with our planning consultants. You guys just saw the two biggest presentations you're going to see on Tech Village you know, in the last two months. After this, it's going to be some small updates about, hey, here's where we're at. Uh, I think it's a good topic of conversation when we do have our first joint planning commission board meeting. Um, because we want to make sure we're all on the same page and that clearly I have a vested interest because like I said that might mean a hundred million dollars worth of taxable value out there uh, which would certainly take some budgetary pressures off. You had a resident ask what will that do to my taxes? Well I can tell you this it makes it very likely that we're not going to be asking for millage increases if we've got a hundred million dollars in new taxable value it will probably lower the amount of tax that we'd be asking residents to pay. That's it. Mr. Lehman, a uh, couple of comments. Sure. One is, uh, I would, at least personally, I'd like to see us add to the list uh, McFarland Library Board just to, uh, it's, it's another joint project uh, between the city and the township, and I want to make sure that our relationship there and our understandings are all uh, uh, for our board to review and, and see if that needs any adjustment. I know that funding is an issue for them as well. Uh, the other point that I want to bring up is with regard to uh, you mentioned you know, meeting with the Parks and Rec as well as with uh, Fire in the month of February. Uh, one of the things that uh, Trustee Mansour brought up that uh, uh, I appreciate him raising it, and it's something that, that I'd like to see us do, and that's to have a Saturday morning session, uh, and primarily so that we can spend a few hours uh, talking about some of the big picture items. Uh, but, you know, we, we've got several joint ventures with the city, and uh, I think following on the heels of, of having their presentation with both the fire and the parks and rec, I, I'm not sure of the time frame. I'd rely on you, Mr. Lamada, to uh, make some suggestions, but maybe following those two presentations uh, sometime early March. Uh, I don't know what everyone's schedules look like for a Saturday morning, but uh, we'd be looking at you know meeting in the morning. You know, maybe having breakfast here and, and working through that. Uh, it'd be a work session where we, we look at, after taking in, you know, these different joint ventures, is taking a look at before we meet with the city especially, uh, what does our agenda look like? What are some of our concerns? Where are some of the hurdles? <coughs> where are some of the opportunities? You know, explore those more fully with the board. And then when we go to meet with the city, um, you know, we're, we know exactly what we need to talk about. Any thoughts? the board on that? So I'd just like to answer a couple things. So um, a couple of the other items, uh, kind of going back to the, the comment uh, about the MTA proposal is uh, maybe we could use some of the time to work out some of the uh, communications just to make sure that we have a good flow and, and you know how to do that right. Um, also, uh, Supervisor Bennett had asked us uh, each for a list of priority uh, uh, initiatives or, or, <laughs> or uh, uh, things that we want to get accomplished in the next year. And so maybe we could spend some time uh, in that session to uh, get those mapped out as well and uh, see how they can fit on the calendar. So there's a couple of additional topics maybe for the session. And I understand the session would probably be uh, an open session, so uh, you know, people would uh, be able to uh, come and hear the discussion. But I would uh, think that we could do it in a maybe a little bit more informal uh, way so we could uh, have some give and take amongst the board members. Right, so that, yes, I have facilitated some board retreats in the past as part of my consulting business. And I'll tell you one thing that I think it's, just, it's an excellent idea and one of the things, if you do it as a work session, if you consider it as a board retreat and it's just a work session, post it, or Lane can post it as a work session. You don't have to have an agenda, but you can have an informal agenda. Um, Trustee Mansour made three excellent suggestions, you know, the joint ventures, communications, and uh, member priorities. We can add to that list and then when you get together and if it's going to be a four hour meeting you can cover a lot of ground in four hours um, you'll leave there uh, much better organized and i think number one would communication is the key agreeing on communication 
Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Master. I'd like for some. I'd like to have some clarification. Are we saying we should meet before the fire department and the uh, and the parks and rent? Um, actually, I'm, I'm suggesting I'm suggesting that we meet after we meet with them, but before we meet with the city in March. Oh, okay. March. okay. We're going to wrap up uh, meeting with the parks and rec and fire in the month of February, and so and we're meeting with the city in April. So I was thinking maybe March, early March, maybe. I don't okay. my calendar here. I don't know if we want to look at some dates right now or do we want to email or email. You want to email out a couple of yeah, dates? Yeah, we'll suppose a few dates. Okay. Okay. We'll email out a few dates and then we'll get your input on which one works best for our board and then we'll so publish it. Excuse me, Supervisor. I'm to sprint in there. Uh, question for you um, regarding these uh, department reviews that are coming up. Uh, will their information be available to us as a part of the board package, or will we have to see it for the first time during the meetings, or how is that done? So typically what happens, um, as personnel director, statutorily you, you don't, like you guys won't actually review the individual department heads, you won't see their performance evaluations. There's a reason for that, and that's because they have a safety valve. Excuse me, maybe I didn't make myself clear. I think you were talking about the boards, or the uh, departments talking about what they do. Oh, oh, those ones, yeah. Yes. So we can do that. I mean, yeah. you can see their PowerPoints ahead of time and as part of the board packet, okay. uh, so that at least you can familiarize yourself you. with it. Sure. Do you have a question? Any other questions for Mr. Lingenau? Okay, Mr. Lighting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, earlier in the meeting, we discussed a topic that uh, concerned a memo that I sent to the board regarding the compensation for the Office of uh, Township Supervisor. And I'm not going to rehash what's in my, my memo because I assume you all have it. You can ask me questions about it. But one of the things that I want to point out to you is that in trying to answer the question, I, I had to go back and review some minutes and a resolution um, that was passed back in 2007 regarding the compensation of the supervisor's office. And as you may or may not know, the township went through a rather extensive evaluation about whether or not they should hire a superintendent pursuant to the Charter Township series of statutes. And if they were going to, what would that office look like as far as responsibilities go? What would the compensation be for the superintendent's office? And what responsibilities would be shifted from what are traditional, uh, traditionally supervisors' duties uh, over to the superintendent? And throughout the, the course of the year, and it took, it took at least that amount of time to hash out all the details of, this, of the process, the board ultimately decided to hire a superintendent, and we passed a resolution that identified the duties that were transferred over, and also discussed the idea of reducing the, uh, the pay for the supervisors, the full-time supervisor's position from 68686 to 18000 annually. And the first document that, that needed to be reviewed regarding that change was a resolution that was passed in December of 2007, which I attached to my correspondence, that showed the actual reduction uh, of the salary for the supervisor's office. The question uh, came up regarding the reduction of the office, uh, particularly in the, in the context of the statutes that deal with uh, compensation for elected officials. And, and it's important because there is a concept that's not just unique to townships, but also to elected officials, that you can't reduce the compensation, specifically the salary, but in my opinion also the compensation of an, of an elected official without that elected official's approval. Um, when the township board reduced the pay or the salary for the supervisor's position, they did so with the then supervisor's approval, and that was supervisor's little. Following that reduction, uh, there was an annual budget put in place, um, and, and that reflected the lower salary rate for the supervisor's position. Um, and then the supervisor's position was vacated by Mr. Zittle and then occupied by Supervisor Hoffman for the next eight years. And the question regarding benefits is an interesting one because in that resolution, there is no mention of benefits. And at the time that resolution was passed, Supervisor Zitto was, was participating in our health care plan. Supervisor Hoffman did not participate in our, in our health care plan. And the question arose as to whether or not the 
benefit, particularly the health care benefit, of, of the Office of Supervisor carried forward even though it wasn't utilized by Supervisor Hoffman. And one of the things that, that needed to be reviewed was there is some, there is some case law on this, uh, on this idea and it primarily has to do with clarifying the idea or the, the concept that an individual office holder is not the one that, that is partaking in the compensation of that office. It belongs to the office itself regardless of who's occupying the seat at that time and also regardless of their performance. Uh, or their hours um, and the like. Things that you, you traditionally think of are, uh, are the purview of office performance and work don't apply to elected officials. So what we had to do, or what I had to do, was go back and review that, that resolution and also the public act and, and the portion of the Michigan Townships, uh, or the Charter Township statutes, that allow the Township Board if there is no uh, annual meeting and there is no compensation commission, allows the township board to set the benefits of the office by resolution. And it's interesting historically, um, based on the records that we have in the township, I, there is no specific reference uh, to health care benefits for elected officials. Now I know that health care benefits are able to be uh, provided to, to elected officials because um, MCL 41.110B specifically says that townships have the authority to give their elected officials health care if they choose. I do know this, and we know this, is that Supervisor um, Zitto was participating in health care. I believe at the time um, our clerk was participating and also our treasurer was. And I, t as I sit here today, I don't know what the status is of their health care, nor do I want them to answer that right now. But it's, it's an eligible benefit for them. And my conclusion after reviewing the resolution that was passed in 2007 and reviewing the statutes um, that have to do with the compensation of elected uh, official was that based on that resolution, only the salary was reduced. At the time, there was, a health, there was the ability to, to participate in a health care plan by the then supervisor that was not removed by this resolution. And as a result, my opinion is that the current supervisor is, is eligible to participate in the health care plan if he chooses to do that. One interesting thing that I did find throughout the statutes and the case law is that there are very, there's a very specific concept that the salary of an office cannot be decreased unless that officer uh, agrees to the decrease. There is a, the ability to create a compensation committee and so the reason I point that out is because you're seeing the difference between the, the word salary and compensation. And my opinion is that the compensation that's available to an office is a part, it's not only compensation, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a benefit or it's an opportunity that passes along that office unless it's, it's specifically reduced with the permission of that office holder. And so, based on my opinion, it looks as though uh, Supervisor Bennett can't participate in the health care plan if he chooses to do so. Um, okay, I'll turn it back here. Mr. Thomas. My question was more of a budgetary uh, quandary, and uh, Supervisor Bennett already explained it to me, so I'm good. Well, and, and I think, again, if this is, if this is something that... No, it, this is something of a, of a budget that Scott that? already in explain it perfectly so anybody else have any other questions i in our discussion when you asked me to re review the uh, minutes uh, mr Lanny, uh, i looked at the guide that the clerk's uh, booklet provided mm -hmm. and i also included that when i sent it to you and that particular resolution uh, never had any mention other than wages on it. So, um, could I ask you to bring forth to this board the type of accurate resolution that should have been adopted? Uh, because I think it was the intent historically for eight years not to, you know, the superintendent and the benefits went to him, and that's why the budgets were always void as far as anything other than the salary. 
Um, so could you, would you develop for us the appropriate type of resolution so we have one? Because there wasn't one that addressed benefits in the Michigan Townships booklet. Well, you can, and, and again, each year, we and, and this is kind of interesting, we, we don't necessarily, we, we set our compensation for our elected officials. Uh, usually, it coincides with our budget year, but we also usually have a separate uh, portion of that resolution that I deal specifically with the salaries of the office. You don't have to continually adopt resolutions if the compensation doesn't change for an office. If the compensation changes, if it goes up, obviously you want to have a resolution that reflects that. If it goes down, you, you will have a resolution that reflects that, but also you're going to need the, the uh, consent of the person whose office um, where the compensation is lowered. And, and interestingly enough, your office several years ago, based on your request, had the compensation lowered. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you want me to create a resolution um, that can be adopted uh, with, within the time frame of your budget process that identifies what benefits are available to elected officials, I'm happy to assist Dennis in that. I don't necessarily think you need to do that at this point in time. I, I think it's because of the what I would say the previous board's intent was not to have benefits go to the supervisor. And over the years, as our attorney, we never heard that we should have adopted a different kind of motion. Well, you're assuming that that's their intent, and you may be, well be correct, but it wasn't reflected in this resolution. Uh, Mr. Laird, that's my mess. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, also, Mr. Laird, or Mr. Levington and I had a discussion and about compensate, Mr. Massey was asking a question about uh, earlier about uh, compensation review for the whole board and how you know that takes place in other townships that you're familiar with. Is that something you do annually? Is that something you do before? Uh, you know, maybe in the latter part of your term. So my recommendation would be, and, and what you'll find out from. Uh, most elected boards is that the compensation gets set. Some use a compensation committee, like Mr. Laddie mentioned earlier, where you take three board members, for example, and make them your compensation committee. Sometimes they pull people from the outside. They take a, a member of, of a public and two board members or something and, and work through putting a compensation together. Other ones just set their own. But at the very least, it should be looked at in every four years because you set the compensation for the next four years. You're not going to alter it you know, during, the, during the term of office, generally. Although there have been boards who have raised it and the, raised their compensation in the, in, during their term of office, and um, as long as they can withstand the political fallout, that's certainly up to you guys. Uh, but I would recommend that you look at it usually the December prior to the following November's election. That means 11 months that people know where you set the compensation and they can make their own decisions based upon that compensation, whether they're interested in pursuing one of those available uh, seats. Mr. Chief. Yes, Mr. Massey. I have strong feelings about coming up with a re resolution to justify something that is going to damage the township. Because when you start talking about conversation and salary, okay, I think we have an excellent board now. I think everybody on the board I like, regardless whether they agree with me or not, okay? But when you start looking at hard work and you want to reduce somebody's conversation or salary, what you're really saying down the road as this township grows, we don't want qualified people. We're looking for mediocre folks. That's what you're going to get. You're not going to have people running, running for the supervisor's position and you have degraded the opportunity to compensate for someone for their hard work, and I like to use the phrase 24 hours a day. All you're doing is asking for mediocre people. And the township is on, is, is on a, a uprising. And you've got to have qualified people. Now, and, and I'll say this, I'm, I'm speaking from my point of view. I will not vote for anybody to lower anybody's salary or uh, even compensation for as their benefits. I would not vote for that. Yeah. I, I would not go along with that. 
I didn't, when, when, no. when we were having a discussion about a resolution, that resolution, in my opinion, would just reflect the current compensation of the board. Right. It wouldn't reflect any, right. any reduction, right. necessarily. No, but, but here's what I think is going to be useful. If I'm wrong, correct me. It's going to be used for the future. Well, the, I don't know how you would write it, but I'm not. Well, the, the way. Well, this is interesting. I'm glad you brought this up. I, I didn't. I mean, the benefits, in my opinion, based on my opinion, the benefits are already in place, and the salaries are already in place. And you're you're free at any time to raise them if you want to raise them in in any form that you choose to raise them. It will always though be the case that if you're trying to lower the compensation for a particular office, you'll need the the absolute permission of that office holder to lower it. And so you're only, without that unusual circumstance, you're just going to be recording and memorializing what's currently in place. And it is true that what we find out, what we found out was with the review of the records that, that we were able to locate throughout this 45-day time frame, we didn't find anything specifically that, that said, uh, here's a resolution that gives our elected officials health care. Um, it might not be a bad idea just for historical purposes to reestablish re that, not just to recognize it, not to establish it because we've already done that. We already participated in a health care plan that we've just re-enrolled it. So it would just be for memorial, memorialization, really, of what's already there. And, the, and in my opinion, the only way that that, that could be used in any way to reduce an, uh, a, a compensation of an office would be if the individual asked you to do it. So, maybe it's an exercise in futility, but it surely wouldn't be an exercise to try to lower somebody's benefits that they currently have as of today. Did, did I answer your question? You asked my question. Okay. Yes. Mr. Conn? Uh, I'd just like to make one comment on the whole thing. Uh, when we're hearing, and through you, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Laddie, did, did I hear you say that Mr. Zittle lowered, uh, agreed to a salary reduction no. while he was still in office? Correct. No. What? No. He did. He absolutely did. He had to. This is this is not new information. And he, he continued to get his health care benefits. Correct. But so, he was still time, so, right? so what I want to put to bed here is this intent that I'm hearing of what a previous board, which I wasn't on, but what a previous board's intent was. How could it be the previous board's intent to remove compensation? <laughs> when in fact they continue to allow that person and that, that office holder to receive that compensation. So there is no intent by that board, or, or I, I don't, I guess maybe then I'm confused as how that could be the intent of that board. Because they continue to allow that individual to hold compensation. So, and I'm not, not for debate, I'm not gonna debate with anybody, I'm just saying I've heard the facts and, and, and that's, that's what I can't understand, how somebody's interpreting what some board's intent was. I got a quick question. So, yes. Supervisor Zill actually took a pay decrease. Mm -hmm. How much did it? What did it go from? Yeah. Sixty-eight, uh, sixty-eight thousand six hundred eighty-six to eighteen thousand. Now, you get, but look at the look at the time frame in this though. It talks about it, it is from January eighth, uh, January January first, two thousand eight, to November twentieth, two thousand eight. Sounds, that's right around election day, that right? Is. It's going to be six hundred, it's sixty-eight thousand six hundred eighty-six dollars, and then beginning November twentieth, two thousand eight to December thirty-first, two thousand eight, it gets reduced. So a year in advance, nearly, not quite a year, maybe eleven months in advance, there was a resolution passed, and this was in December of two thousand seven, to reduce future wages, yeah. just like Mr. Lima talked about, right. and it was passed with the approval of the entire board, including Mr. Zittle, to lower the salary of that office. Um, Mr. Laddie, though, I think what, how I interpreted that motion was they could set his salary at 68000 up until November 20th is the election day automatic turnover to the next board. And what they were saying was that effective with 1120 of 2008, whoever was elected, instead of being paid 68,000, was going to be paid 18,000. Right. And for those four right. years when I was on the board, that's all that Mrs. Hoffman received. And the budget that the board set for 2008, for her and that position was 18,000, 
without, in the budget, without any other benefits, and that's what the board approved. And each year that she was here, at least for the four years I was there, the budget showed the 18,000 and no benefits. That's what the board discussion was um, from November 20th of 2008 till November 20th of 2012. And, and, and that's what happened. Right. right, and so that's where the reduction is because right. they were going to a superintendent. Mr. Guzak? Right, I think they, she's exactly right. They had to reduce the wage because they know going forward, the supervisor was going to be part-time and they were hiring a full-time superintendent. And he was going to have the wages and the benefits. Right. And then the part-time supervisor was only going to have running the meetings and the other things and not have the benefits. And that's why it wasn't in the 2008 budget for benefits since it's been there. I haven't seen it in the budget since 2008. So, Mike Thomas, I'm sorry. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Lanning. So, well, which is it? You said that uh, Mr. Zittle did take a pay cut, and now he didn't take a pay he, cut? He voted to reduce the pay right. of his office. Okay, he, he voted, was in the but future. did he? He, right. didn't, he, didn't, he didn't feel the reduction. Right. He, 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 I'm he, sorry. He still had to agree. Right. So he did not take a reduction in his salary. That's right. That is right. practically correct, but the office compensation was reduced right. as far as the salary goes. Okay. So and it was effective when? It was effective October of This was for the cal this is for the budget year of two thousand eight. Right. So in, in essence he did not take again, not in practical use like you're saying, but that's correct. Practically he did not he right. did not have a decrease in his salary. Right. But the office was decreased. But the office was set because the new person coming in had to take that wage. Correct. And then they, when they were running for the office, they knew what the wage was going to be. It was going to be 18 and not 68. That is correct. And without benefits. That, and I don't know, well, I don't again, know the answer you, to that. All right. right. But again, the discussions we had as a board had that intent between 2008 and November of 2012. So that is why I requested since now the intent of our board, and I am assuming the 2012 to 16, since the resolution was done incorrectly or incompletely, whatever is the right word. Well, you're assuming that, but for I, I was on the board and part could. of the discussion. So I'm just saying, uh, with, can we have you develop uh, a proper resolution that would be the start of something for future examples because the township I'm not I'm not going to agree that this is an improper resolution necessarily it doesn't reflect the benefits that were that were being awarded to the offices at the time but as I said earlier if you want to entertain a resolution that accounts for the benefits that are currently in place you can have that resolution I would like to say that uh, I would only be in favor of that if we review all the compensation and benefits. But I, I think it's premature to do that for um, the reason that Mr. Lehman has stated in terms of. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Manson. Yes, what I'm going to say. Since my favorite colleague, colleague said that the, what the intent was, now let me tell you what, based on what you have said, what the intent was. The intent was for Mr. Zillow to throw a monkey wrench into the game. Because he, listen, okay. he never received a salary decrease. And he knew he was not going to run for re-election. So he did that intentionally for the next person coming on, along. But he had to have everybody vote on him. Well, I'm just saying what the intent was. Because... Because my colleague used the word intent, nobody said anything. Now I'm speaking out against the word intent. I understand what the word means, but I'm saying his intent was quite obvious now that he wasn't going to, he, he was never going to take the salary decrease. He was setting it up for someone else. And in essence, what he did, I know Mr. Zill quite well, okay? I know him quite well. And I didn't appreciate some of the things he did personally. Okay? I know him quite well. I do not believe he had good intents for the township. 
I'm, I'm speaking from a personal point of view. I'm not speaking for, from the board's point of view. He did not have good intent. And it's quite obvious what he did. If he had good intent, all he would have said, this day going forward, my salary will be decreased. I will not accept what six, approximately $68,000. That's what good intent. But he didn't have good intent. Mr. Mansour? Yeah, Mr. Supervisor. I think uh, we've had a lot of discussion about this. Everyone's had at least one opportunity to talk about it. Uh, we've gone from the realm of discussing what the facts are, discussing maybe a little conjecture about what people were thinking or not thinking. So uh, it's 9.36, and I'm wondering if we can move past this topic and the rest of the agenda. Well, that's the last thing on the agenda, so. Support motion for to adjourn. I'm sorry, ma'am. Support. We'll support. Make a motion, please. <laughs> Clark. Clark. Support. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Dress yeah. rehearsal for. Uh,